Um, hello everyone, uh, welcome to our SEDA Tech Talk series. Um, yeah, so i uh, just talk a bit about the format of the meeting. So we are going to have the speaker to give the presentation first, and we are going to record it. And when the presentation finished, then we are going to stop the recording and you can start your asking your questions. Um, yeah, so and for uh, our tech talk today, we are going to have um, Dr. Richard Zhang from Adobe Research and Richard is going to talk about colorization and any resolution generation. Um, I hand it over to you, uh, Richard. Hi, great. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Um, thanks so much for having me. So yeah, this is on uh, colorization and any resolution generation. Of course, I'm very excited to be here. So um, modify my title here. Likewise, um, I'm a researcher here in uh, San Francisco at, at Adobe. Okay, um, so where this work started was back in uh, grad school, back in uh, 2016, um, discriminative networks were really taking off and finding success. And the way those work is if you have an image on the left, um, you take this high dimensional input, squish it down to a low dimensional output. Um, for example, just a single uh, classification label, for example, rockfish. What we wanted to see is, is it possible to push networks to produce high dimensional outputs instead and predict raw unlabeled pixels? Um, for example, uh, could we predict the color components um, given the grayscale component here of, of this rockfish? Okay, so essentially we're trying to predict a two dimensional signal, um, the color information or the LA, uh, AB channels um, from a one dimensional signal, which is the grayscale image. And of course, if you concatenate the input and output, you can uh, get you know, pleasing visual results, hopefully. A, plausibly colorized image of uh, the grayscale uh, input. Okay, um, so is this even possible? Well, let's just do some introspection here. So here's an iconic photo of uh, Yosemite Valley Bridge by Ansel Adams. So how would this look like in color? Well, we know that the water should be uh, blue, the sky should be blue, the vegetation should be green, and the mountains should be brown. And sure enough, um, our system is able to predict kind of plausible colors for um, this image. Okay, so um, one back then we were trying to figure out what, what is the appropriate loss function to use here. Um, so what you need to do, of course, is gather training data. In this case, training data is essentially for free. Um, you can get any image, desaturate it, and that gives you your X, Y training pairs. Um, okay, and so what we tried at first was a simple loss function, and this was our initial colorization attempt. And you see that these colorization results are um, honestly, not very good. They're kind of dull and desaturated and not realistic. So why is that the case? Well, um, here we can do a little introspection on this bird here. Um, and we can remark that this bird could be um, any number of colors. It could be blue, it could be red. We don't really know. Um, and given that there's a whole bunch of different possibilities, the best thing the network can do um, if you have some sort of simple loss function is to average between all of them. And that's why you get something that's kind of desaturated and in the middle here. Okay, um, and that just shows that uh, regression with L2 is um, kind of inadequate. Um, so what we did was we broke the problem up into uh, multinomial classification. So we divided the output space into a whole bunch of bins, um, like little 10 by 10 bins. So we converted this regression problem into classification. So instead of predicting a single colorization for or single color for every single pixel, we instead predict the distribution of possible colors that it could be. Okay. And if you do this, um, here's the result we get. Um, so this is kind of a four dimensional map. What you see is that within each tile, um, it shows um, a, the pixels um, that are predicted to be likely, they're likely predicted to be that color. So if we zoom in here, uh, we see that in the foreground, um, this thing is predicting the bird could be blue, could be red, could be purple, could be any amount of things. Um, and the background could be Vegetation could be green, yellow, brown, um, different possible color for grass as well. Okay. And so we see that, um, you know, images that used to work with regression still work. Um, but with this bird, um, by doing classification, we're able to get something that's more, uh, more vibrant. We're able to get this blue bird and with the yellow belly. I should mention that there's kind of one final step after you predict the distribution um, for every single pixel, you have to kind of choose um, something that's close to the mode um, of that distribution to, to get this vibrant result. Okay, 
And if we compare to the ground truth, um, the ground truth bird actually here is yellow, which is not anything close to uh, this blue bird. Um, but because the blue bird is kind of vibrant and more realistic than this dull sepia bird, um, we're perhaps happy, even though from an L2 sense, um, the ground truth and our prediction is actually um, very, very different. Okay, um, so what we've seen here is that uh, losses that account for multimodality um, in the output space really improves uh, visual realism. Okay, and then we tried this on a whole bunch of legacy black and white images, um, like this bridge. We took this image, this is a thylacine, and this is an extinct animal. This is the last one that's um, known to be alive. Although I'll mention there, um, supposedly scientists are, I think, trying to revive this creature. Um, so perhaps we'll get to get to see it in the future. We'll see what happens there. Um, there's a photo of my father and my great grandfather uh, back in the 1950s. And it predicts some kind of plausible colors for the face um, and the vegetation. And um, yeah, of course, there are failure cases. So one issue with this is uh, that um, in re we, we noticed in regions where there could be multiple colors, like red or blue, uh, the network has a tough time deciding which one to go with. So you get this um, kind of tie-dye um, experience um, between the two. OK. Um, but moreover, um, there's a more fundamental issue at play, which is um, which we can get at when we examine this photo of um, this is migrant mother, which is a uh, kind of classic American photo from um, the kind of depression era. So if we examine this image and we ask what color is the, um, the skin, like the mother's skin or the face, um, we probably know what it is. It's skin colored. Um, but if we ask what color is her shirt, well, that could be Again, any number of things. It could be, you know, red. It could be blue. Uh, it could be brown. It could be a lot of things. Um, and moreover, um, if I ask you what color are her children's shirts or the baby's blanket, well, we also don't know. So, at the end of the day, like all the possible colorizations of this single grayscale image, um, it's really a, a not only a multimodal, but it's also a, a combinatoric problem. So, at the end of the day, if your algorithm can only give one result. Um, it's limited because there's really a whole space of results that, that could be out there. Okay, so um, back in 2016, it, there was our method, there were a few other methods. Um, they were all predicting just one met one result. Um, and interestingly, they all predict kind of the, the same kind of uh, results as well, but there's really a lot of different possibilities. So what we wanted to do was, um, basically what we came to the conclusion was that Actually, we maybe need a user in the loop to select what the user actually wanted, um, right? We can't just give one result. We need to give a whole space of results that the user can kind of interact with um, in order to choose what they want. Okay. Um, so using our kind of user guidance system, um, with interaction, a user could go in and produce these this kind of result with a blue shirt and a gray shirt with the children. Or they can predict something like this with a green shirt or this. Yeah. Okay. So um, here's a system demo that we have. So on the left, we have a grayscale image. Here's a UI kit that we came up with. On the right, we have an initial colorization by the system. So for this input cup, the system initially is predicting a red cup. What we're able to do is um, on the left here, um, give a whole bunch of suggested colors for um, this input point. And for example, if they User now adds a uh, given point. Um, so now the input is a grayscale image and a single blue point. The system is able to um, efficiently propagate this point to uh, the rest of the image and predict that this cup is uh, should be blue. OK, and notice that it's actually able to propagate this uh, user input, uh, not just within the specific kind of region up top, but also um, across the, the whole cup. So it has some notion underneath of what this whole object is and how um, the user inputs should be interacting with the whole uh, object. OK, now there is this undesired artifact where it kind of got a little overzealous. Um, you have this kind of weird blue shadow. Um, the user, upon seeing this, may get unhappy. But what they can do is add a single um, gray point, and um, this undesired artifact can be actually removed. OK. 
Um, and here we have a whole bunch of suggested colors. So you can treat the first point as kind of a control point and you can select uh, different colors for the cup here, um, you know, pink, orange, whatever, whatever you want. So you can quickly really toggle between all the uh, kind of the multiple modes um, that we're working with here. Okay. Um, and on the left, we also have a continuous color palette. So if the user is not happy with any of their, these being limited to these discrete choices, they can kind of slowly drag this point and you can see the cup uh, slowly changing color um, as well on the right. So the user can, in the end of the day, select um, anything that they want here, really. Okay. So how do we actually modify the system in order to do this? Well, uh, with automatic colorization, our system took a grayscale image, a particular color. Um, here, we're simply adding user points, and we um, basically add that as extra channels. Um, so it's a three-dimensional signal. So two of the dimensions are on the AB values, the, the chrominance values, and the last component is kind of a, a binary mask telling the system where the user points are exactly. Okay, and here, um, we start, we're still dealing with this multimodal problem, um, but it's in a sense being continuously resolved for us um, through the um, user input. So with enough user input, the problem starts, um, instead of becoming multimodal, starts becoming a unimodal problem, which is much easier to predict. Now training the system, um, we have to ask how we're gonna do that. So before with the automatic system, we just had to gather these X, Y pairs. Now we need um, kind of a triplet of X, the grayscale, U, which is the user input, and Y, which is um, the ground truth um, color. Now, it's really easy to get X and Y. Uh, you just take images and desaturate them. It wasn't very clear how to get uh, U, which is these uh, user-guided inputs. Um, like, how are we gonna do this? If we, uh, like these systems are trained with, let's say millions of um, data points, like if we have users sit down and, um, give interactions like millions of times, that's gonna be really expensive. Um, and it's really just not easily obtainable. So uh, we were a little stuck here as to what to do, but um, what we decided was just like try the dumbest, uh, most straightforward thing, let's say, uh, which is that we can take um, the ground truth Y and randomly sample points from the ground truth colorization, ground truth color. So we can kind of call this a random re random revealing. So we can random reveal points in Y and treat that as synthetic user inputs. Um, now the advantage of that is you can get a lot of uh, simulated user points. Um, you can get infinite simulated user points for zero cost. The disadvantage being that they're not necessarily um, gonna be realistic and it's not exactly how users are gonna interact with the system. So at test time, you're gonna potentially have a, a domain gap um, with the train time. So we were actually very worried about this, but we went ahead and, and tried it anyways. Um, and to our surprise is actually um, created a system that was pretty usable. Okay, so um, you can also think of the these um, randomly reveal points as kind of hints, right? Because the network is directly getting access to some information of why, um, it's really incentivized to take advantage of um, this information. So it, it's really uh, shouldn't be ignoring this information because it's going to help it minimize minimize the loss. Okay, so here's what the simulated user points um, kind of look like. So we grab a variable number of points from random locations. Um, and the number of revealed points comes from a geometric distribution, uh, which means that uh, about one eighth of the time, it's actually giving no points. Um, so it's being forced to do automatic colorization as before. Most of the time it's getting a few points, you know, let's say like one to eight, eight points. Um, and then some portion of the time, some percentage of the time it's getting many, many points. Um, and it even has some possibility of getting infinite points, which is the, the whole image, right? So the idea is that it's supposed to uh, be able to work on this whole spectrum. So um, even with no points, it's supposed to give a reasonable result as the user is adding more and more information, it should be able to continuously incorporate this information. And if the user specifies every single pixel, uh, the color of every single pixel, the system should just follow the user's guidance in that respect. So we wanted to really give um, reasonable behavior across this whole spectrum. Okay. 
And um, it's able to kind of integrate these hints in a learnable end to end framework here. Okay, um, so here's um, the system kind of trying on some legacy black and white photos. So, this is a picture of my uh, grandparents. So, we can adjust the background color and the uh, color of my grandmother's shirt here. Um, so, my, my grandparents really appreciate this. Actually, after we released the paper, um, like I put these results online. At some point I was reviewing a paper and suddenly this picture of my grandparents came up. I was just like really shocked. Um, so this picture kind of propagated a, a little bit around as well. Okay, uh, what's fun is that you can also use it for unusual colorization. So elephants, we can make them gray, but um, what we really want I think is a, a pink elephant. And so interestingly um, in the training set, it's actually never seen a pink elephant. It's only ever seen gray elephants and you know, random gray points. But at test time, actually, if a user produces um, something that's kind of off manifold and unrealistic colorization, the system is actually happy to trust the user and follow the user's guidance in, in creating what they want here. Um, here's another example. We have this um, actor and um, maybe we want, we think uh, green suits him. So we can go ahead and do that. Okay. So we can also quantitatively evaluate the benefit of user hints here. Um, so we take a thousand holdout images and randomly reveal ground truth points. Um, on the x-axis here, we have the amount of interaction um, on a log scale um, from zero. Well, zero is kind of added to this log scale, but really from one to 500. Um, and we have what we'll call accuracy, which is uh, in this case, just good old uh, PSNR in decibels, where the higher is better. Okay, so on the bottom left, we have automatic methods uh, with no interaction. And as we start adding points, um, these start going into the regime of user guided methods. And so if you just um, don't do anything, you just predict Ray as a baseline, uh, you get about 23 PSNR. Uh, our system without a user, um, it's going to get about 24 and a half, something like that. Um, now, as you start adding points, if we, um, use kind of traditional graphics techniques. Uh, so this is a method by um, uh, not Levin at all. Um, you can get this kind of curve where the more points you add, um, the closer to the ground truth you get predictably. And we're hoping to predict this, front, pre uh, we're hoping to move this frontier upwards, right? Um, and that's what we're able to do with, with our system. So um, in this kind of fast to interactive, fast to medium interaction regime with uh, very few points or medium number of points, uh, we're able to get to a good result or a more accurate result faster than baseline systems. But interestingly, um, if you go to the end here, like with 500 points, where you're basically specif completely specifying um, the color of the system or the color of the image, um, our system and the baseline kind of traditional graphics methods end up converging, right? Um, and that kind of makes sense because if you're um, using very few points, data-driven methods really help, like learning from a big training set helps. If the user is specifying every single um, pixel, good old image processing techniques actually work um, ju just perfectly, right? There's really no need to have a, a large-scale database in, 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 that, um, in that setting. So um, yeah, so it's kind of good, good that our, our system is able to incorporate that information, um, but it's really not necessary at this um, big interaction regime, where we really provide values as fast and medium interaction regime. Uh, and then here's some other um, baseline methods uh, as well. Okay. Um, and one thing about our system is that before we were using um, these kind of uh, color, color hints, but these kind of points as hints, but that's not the only type of hint that um, you can use. You can essentially um, just change the type of hint that you provide and train the exact same system exact same method. For example, we can predict, produce a global color histogram instead, and we can get kind of um, color transfer um, behavior as well. So we have this grayscale image. We can then colorize it with the chrominance components from these smaller inset images um, and get these kind of results. So this is just a uh, kind of very different way of exploring um, this multimodal problem as well um, with basically the same algorithm, just kind of redesigning the type of input that we're getting. Okay, and here's these kind of interesting uh, color balls. 
Okay, and I like this one where we take the color of the lower key and, and put on these um, big gray balls, these, um, these balls here. Okay, um, so this was back in 2016, 2017. Obviously, a lot has happened. Um, so I was doing this work back at Berkeley since I joined Adobe. Um, this is something I was able to engage with product teams about, and now you can actually try it. Um, so if you get Photoshop elements, Photoshop neural filters, um, you can actually try our system in there as well. And really the biggest thing though that's happened is that, um, so, so this work was really, I'd say one of the first uh, kind of line of works that were trying to take uh, networks and predict photorealistic images, um, predict pixels. Obviously a lot has happened in this space since then, uh, like GANs, diffusion models, a whole bunch of families of general models, which are really um, taking the world by storm. Okay. Um, so unless you've kind of uh, been on a rock, you, you've probably seen a lot of um, these types of works. Like these, the last two years, I'd say, has really been a watershed year, watershed kind of era in um, this field of image generation. We have multiple um, kind of foundational models that are sure to be the backbone of many uh, creative applications in the future, such as the StyleGuy family, um, uh, image GPT party kind of autoaggressive type methods, as well as uh, diffusion models like Dolly, Imagine. Now there's, uh, I mean, this, this slide is a few months old, so now there's even more like um, views and um, and all sorts of things. So um, this is really just taking the world by storm. Um, but in some respects, they still they actually do remain limited. So um, we can kind of imagine why that is. So in the lab, when we're developing algorithms. We make a lot of uh, assumptions to make our lives easier. One is that the data it, that we use is kind of fairly uniform in terms of size, right? Uh, we assume everything comes in nice 256 by 256 or 512 by 512 um, images, whereas the real world doesn't really look like that. If you go on Google or Flickr and download a bunch of images, you see that images come in all different shapes and, and sizes. They don't come in such a cookie cutter manner. Um, so really well, what, what's happening is we're training these algorithms on kind of an artificially homogeneous slice of the world. Um, and it's kind of wasteful actually. If you take images in the wild to create these data sets, just think about what we're doing. Uh, we're putting them through this funnel where if the images are too low resolution, we just throw them away. If they're too high resolution, we end up um, just downsampling them in order to predict, to produce these fixed resolution data sets. So we do this before any learning has actually happened. So that's actually very wasteful. Um, so we want to take a step back and relax this uh, assumption, this constraint, and just say, uh, can we just use every pixel that we have? Uh, this is actually much more a much more natural way to deal with data in the, uh, in the world. OK, so here we're producing what we'll call this uh, any resolution data set. OK, and the good thing about this is you can uh, you don't have to start from scratch. We can start from, um, we can kind of leverage work that um, the hard work that Previous researchers have done. For example, you can take the Elson data set, which has over 100,000 low res images of uh, different categories, for example, here of churches. And we can go on Flickr and grab just a few images of high res churches. Okay. So here um, we're just grabbing about 6,000 images, which is going to be about like 5% of this overall data set um, between the low res and the high res images. And what we're hoping for is a system that's able to take advantage of all this data that's able to leverage um, the structure of the low-res image, as well as the high-frequency details of, of the high-res images. OK, and this is what we uh, did. Uh, actually, it was already published in uh, ECB last year. Um, OK, so where we started with was the StyleGAN 3 architecture. Um, it has this um, nice property. So it first of all, it takes this uh, low-dimensional latent code Z, puts through these generator layers, and predicts an image. Uh, what it also does is it um, takes as input a uh, continuous, um, it takes in a coordinate grid that's sampled from a continuous set of coordinates from 0, 0 on the upper left to 1, 1 on the bottom right. And um, that allows us to do a few um, manipulations to our advantage. So one thing we can do is sample this coordinate grid more densely. And theoretically, this should predict a, an image. I mean, this will predict an image of higher resolution. Hopefully, we can make it a good image. Um, the we can just sample it at a frequency that's kind of inversely proportional to the scale, right? And get more pixels out. 
And it also helps to inject the sampling rate directly into the network. Uh, that's kind of an implementation, implementation detail on, that we show on the bottom left here. Um, and this enables a single generator to predict, uh, produce multiple resolutions. So we have a data set that can produce multiple resolutions. We can have our generator also produce multiple resolutions. Now there's a problem here. Um, all our methods uh, kind of rely on batching, right? We want, usually we get images of the same size so that they can be stacked together in a nice tensor. Um, but if you have different images of different resolutions together, there's no way to um, stack them. And furthermore, if you have images of really, really high resolution, like, you know, 60 megapixel or, or higher, it's not even gonna fit in your GPU at all, okay? So how do we get around this? Well, there's kind of one more trick, which is that um, we can, instead of um, inputting all the um, pixels in the coordinate grid, we can instead just input a um, small set and we can directly query the generator for just a small patch. So what that means is we can predict the same size patches, um, but from different resolution images and we can end up uh, stacking them together. Okay. And this allows us to um, basically get nice batches, right? Because we can batch same size batches, even from images that have different underlying scales. Okay, so from here, we're almost home free. We query the generator for these different patches. We can take our data set, uh, also grab different, uh, basically same size patches from different sized images that are in the data set. And then we can put them through a discriminator, which is uh, how, how GANs work. Okay. So at this point, we have some system for sampling patches and making sure they look realistic. Uh, we also want to make sure that uh, we have global consistency, right? We don't want, you know, the bird's um, feet at the top of the image and the bird's head at the bottom of the image. Uh, that just wouldn't make sense at all. Um, so we also have a little bit of uh, structured guidance here. Okay, so here's the uh, loss. We're now in a math for the patch sampling. Um, but we also have a kind of a well-trained low resolution model that we can sample from. Um, and this could be a, uh, this teacher model could be a pre-trained network that someone else has trained. Um, basically it just needs to be a well-trained model on, um, on the images, uh, low res images, right? And we can use that as guidance. The only question is how do we do it? Because um, the teacher is producing a low res image the, uh, in this case, what I guess we'll call a student is predicting a high-res patch. Um, the thing is, the good thing is we've stored the image transformation, right? So we know what patch we can sample from in the teacher, and we can simply take the high-res image, downsample it, um, and now we have two things that are both comparable. Okay, and we can predict, we can produce a, use a per-pixel loss, L2, LPIPs, whatever your favorite um, per-pixel loss is. Okay. So we have uh, these two these two loss terms and this kind of lambda, um, this lambda. Now this lambda is going to trade off between the consistency between scales as well and the high resolution quality. Um, and I'll say that um, you can kind of toggle between the two, but for our application, um, high resolution quality is actually the priority. And um, so um, the teacher loss is just used to kind of predict produce some stability in the system. Um, and really, we are, our emphasis is predicting is producing really high quality, um, high resolution generations. Okay, now um, one comparison we made was super resolution because that's actually one way that you could potentially get high resolution generations. You can take uh, a low resolution GAN, um, for example, here you can um, run it through super resolution algorithms like LIF, real ESR, ESR GAN. And we can compare that to our method, which um, again has a little bit of high frequency or high from high resolution data sprinkled in. Um, now we can kind of zoom in here and compare between them. And we see some interesting uh, behavior here. So if we look at the roof line, uh, we see that the input image here has some of these weird artifacts. Actually, um, I was unsure why this is, but it turns out um, this is just JPEG artifacts from the training set. Um, this is actually very bad. So um, what happens is if you take images, you downsample them, um, they really shouldn't have these artifacts, but if you save them as JPEG images with the um, default parameters, um, 
these artifacts, these are like uh, classic quantum quantization artifacts of high frequency DC decomponents, which is going to appear all across your edges. Um, so as a general PSA, if you're we're trying to have some better practices for the community, at least I'm encouraging that. Um, so please don't save the images um, as JPEG. And if you do, please at least have the decency to um, use a higher uh, quality. So not the default 75, use like 95 or something um, that, that really doesn't have these artifacts. Uh, because if we have all these artifacts in our training sets, um, it's going to produce, it's going to propagate into our algorithms, right? That, that's just a necessary fact of life. Okay, but given that uh, this has already happened, uh, what are we going to do about it? Well, uh, at this point, the super resolution algorithms have to make kind of an awkward choice. Um, they, have to, they have to decide, do we stick with um, these artifacts? And LIF does, so it kind of just accentuates them. Uh, or do we suppress them? Uh, which is kind of a good thing that e real ESR can does. But because it's trained on, um, uh, it, it has a very hard task of doing super resolution on every single type of image. It's unable to predict a, um, predict a kind of realistic image or realistic texture for the um, roof here. And so our method does a bit better for that, though it's not perfect. Okay, so I'm really trying to emphasize that unlike super resolution, direct super resolution, our setting has the freedom to uh, really fix the res fixed artifacts observed at low resolution, as long as you have high quality, high resolution images um, in your data to learn, to learn from. Okay. And so here's one other type of uh, strange artifact. Uh, this church is fine, but what in the world is this uh, ghost of a Shutterstock logo uh, doing in there? Well, it turns out uh, about 10% of the images have the Shutterstock logo in it. So of course it's gonna uh, end up learning it as well. And so with our system, if we vary the scale, we're able to kind of melt this away. Okay. Um, one thing is we really need to figure out how to evaluate this and actually existing uh, evaluation metrics are um, actually uh, by design unsuitable for evaluating this type of task. So how um, evaluation methods such as FID work is you take real images and generate images, you put them through a network to grab um, features, and then you compare the first and second moments of the distributions of these features, uh, which is called the Fréchet distance. Uh, and the idea being that if your generating images are simulating the real images faithfully, then these uh, these first and second moments should also um, be cl pretty closely matched. So this is reasonable, but what's kind of overseen is that there's actually this uh, manual downsampling step to 299 to try to get a global context of the image. Um, and this is actually uh, problematic for two reasons. So one is that um, a lot of our libraries, for whatever reason, um, ignore kind of signal processing principles and don't anti-alias when downsampling. And so this um, simple downsampling step actually adds artifacts itself. Um, so as another aside, um, in this other paper, we're trying to uh, move towards having some better practices, right? So if you're going to downsample, um, you need to anti-alias, and that's what we do for this, what we call clean FID. Uh, but even aside from that, um, in th this step, we're actually explicitly trying to um, evaluate high frequency signals. So downsampling actually blows them away. So any sort of downsampling is uh, uniquely inappropriate for evaluating this type of test. So um, what we do is instead um, remove that downsampling step and just say we'll, we'll take 299 by 299 crops. Um, and so that's what we call patch up ID. So we found um, this is a much more fair evaluation metric when you're trying to um, evaluate high frequency textures. Okay, so we can evaluate patch FID versus some baselines, higher, or sorry, lower is better. Um, here's the baseline LIF and real ESR again. These are kind of super resolution methods. They get um, these values across these different data sets. And our method gets something that's um, much lower. Okay, uh, so from here, I can show some qualitative results. Um, here's the bird. Um, birds are hard to take high resolution photographs of because if you get near them, they fly away. So we might as well just generate them. Um, we can also do this trick where you kind of walk around the latent space. You can do that low res or you can do that at high res and see that they're pretty well synchronized. Okay, we can also um, use mountains. So here, this mountain is at 1024. This was kind of the previous 
state of the art in terms of resolution. And we're able to very aggressively push this um, higher and higher. So here we're at uh, going at 2,800. So about nine megapixels. You see interesting patterns in the vegetation, the dirt, um, and such. Here's another kind of mountainscape. As we're zooming in, we have kind of a nice swamp. Uh, this is kind of what San Francisco is looking like, uh, given all the rain we had. Okay. And we can do this um, kind of latent manipulation as well. Also, an unfortunate reality that we're uh, getting all this resolution and pushing them through Zoom. Um, okay. Okay. So, uh, one more thing that we can do, uh, kind of as additional application, is that uh, what we've shown is that you can train with uh, patches uh, to get uh, high resolution images. Um, and we did that by kind of parameterizing the coordinate grid from zero to one in both X and Y directions. What we can do is also um, in the Y direction, keep the parameterization, but in the X direction, parameterize it instead from negative pi to pi and use uh, kind of cosine sine embedding so that um, it's continuously going to wrap around. Uh, and by just doing that, you can actually generate kind of fake panoramas, um, even though there are zero panoramas in the training set. Um, so before, what we were saying was that you can generate high res images from just patches, but you needed a little bit of structured guidance to kind of keep things in place. Um, here, we don't have any of that structured guidance. We, in essence, are only training from patches, right? The whole images in this case are patches of panoramas, but we're actually able to get something that's uh, coherent. Um, and the reason for that is because you know, the, st the statistics in this case are stationary in the X direction. And if the statistics are stationary, you can learn just from the patches. You don't actually need um, global context. Okay. So um, we've also done some uh, controlled experiments to show that all our kind of steps are necessary. So to do that, we need to have a kind of controlled setting. So for that, we use FFHQ, where you do have ground truth. Um, we'll call them high-res images at 1024 available. Uh, we can use that as an oracle for evaluation, but for training, we can. Um, Kind of sample from this training from the set to produce an artificial any res data set just for testing purposes. So a low res, you can downsample all the images to 256. Um, for kind of higher or mixed res, we can downsample five of them between 512 and 1024, and we can keep uh, a thousand of them at the full 1024. Okay, so we can see how efficiently can we learn from uh, this kind of uh, low to mid resolution view of this uh, Oracle high res data set. So first thing we ask is, is uh, multi-size training necessary? We could perhaps just train, take all the images and downsample them to 512. Um, we can evaluate them with uh, FID and patch FID. And again, FID is good for evaluating structure because it's downsampled to a global 299 by 299 size um, and kind of look at the whole image at a time. And patch ID is more for texture because it's taking crops of the image. Okay, so here, if we resize everything down, we get uh, this result. Because five, at 512, you can't really, um, if you're just learning from 512 images, you're not going to get any information at 1024. So by definition, you can't produce any um, 10, any realistic textures at 1024. Um, you can artificially resize everything up to 1024. Um, so that way, you're not losing the information from the high-res 1024 images. But you are introducing artifacts, because that the 512 images are just being bilinearly upsampled to 1024. They're not really. Um, drawn from the distribution of 1024 images. So you get something better, but it's also not going to be completely satisfactory. You could just say, forget about um, resizing up or down. Let's just take our 1024 images and just train on that. And actually, that does better. So uh, what that shows is resizing manually causes a bunch of artifacts. It's better to even not do that. Just throw that data away. Just use the data you have, the good data you have, um, if anything. But the best thing is to not resize, but also take advantage of the data, which is what our methods able to do. So we'll take advantage of all the data at whatever resolution it's given um, and, and learn from it effectively without kind of resizing it and creating artifacts um, in your data set. Okay, and then we also asked how data efficient are these high resolution images? So 
uh, what we can do is we can vary the number of high res images from uh, 1000 all the way up to the full set. And we can see um, if FID and patch FID go down. And what we see is that um, it's actually hard to see any pattern between all these numbers. They're all actually about the same. I mean, some of them are higher, some of them are lower. Um, and what that's indicating is that actually the learning is pretty efficient. Um, uh, just a few high resolution images can actually um, go uh, really far, right? You don't necessarily need uh, all your images to be high res. If you just have a lot of low res images, but a few high res images sprinkled in, you can actually end up getting very good high res images at, at the end. Okay. Um, and we've also uh, created a um, kind of a kind of face model. So before the state of the art, Face model is at around 1024. Um, we're able to um, up-res this model uh, to something much higher. Here, we're going up to uh, all the way up to 4096. So you can see um, kind of more detail in the hair and the eyes here. Okay, and we can uh, do latent walks. So on the bottom left is the kind of all 1024 on the right here, we have uh, nine megapixel. This is drawn kind of proportionally and we can do a latent walk between the two. And we see, um, again, kind of higher resolution results in the eyes here. Okay. Okay, so here in this project, we're looking at really supporting data in its native size. We can efficiently push resolution well beyond 1024, uh, which is kind of, I think, the first method that's able to do so. And our coded models are available online here. Okay, so here's the, the projects that I described uh, in this talk. All right, thank you very much. Um, thanks, uh, Richard, for your very interesting talk and very impressive visual demonstration. So. We stop the recording here and um, now can take